Katie Gallagher, Australia is currently experiencing one of its biggest ever housing crises, yet the government has committed less money to a housing fund to do something about that than it's committed to the National Manufacturing Reconstruction Fund. Does the government really understand how significant a crisis we have on our hands and should you in the budget on Tuesday be putting more money into that fund? Uh, hi, Laura, and thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, well, you're absolutely correct around the issues uh, facing uh, housing in the country, and we're acutely aware of those. I mean, one of the issues we're we're dealing with here is a bit of catch up. The Commonwealth had kind of vacated the field in terms of social and affordable housing for the last 10 years. We're coming back, getting back to the table with the states and territories and wanting to work with them on how we increase supply because the levers available to the Commonwealth really about uh, the ways to increase supply of housing across Australia. So the Housing Australia Future Fund was a commitment we made in the election. It's, you know, a bill that's stuck in the Senate at the moment. We'd like to get that through. We'd like to get it up and running. But it isn't the only intervention uh, that we are doing and we are absolutely taking it seriously. Well, since it was originally announced, HAF, which is the Housing uh, Fund, uh, uh, interest rates have gone up 20%. So the amount of money available, in a way, is reduced. And, uh, you know, it's not really delivering the intent in those circumstances of your original commitments. Um, it's also supposed to release around $500 million a year, but that's not indexed, which means $500 million a year this year will not be the same as in 10 years. Now, these are issues that um, the independent Senator David Pocock has raised, and he seems to have a point, doesn't he, if you're trying to maximise the bang for your buck. So I think a good start, frankly, would be to actually try and get the support for this bill so that we can get it up and running and make those investments. And then if over time, um, you know, let's see how it works. I mean, this is a significant investment of taxpayers' funds. Um, we know that the funds that have been set up under the Future Fund have, have returned, uh, strong returns, and have been able to make disbursements. But at this point, you know, the government's trying to get the thing up and running just to begin with, let alone talk about more money or indexing payments down the track, we can't even get it established. And I think that's the first job. We remain open, of course, uh, to discuss with the crossbench uh, ideas about how to increase investment in housing. We'll continue those discussions. I would repeat that half is one measure we want to look at. There are other measures that the government's working on, including with the states and territories around planning reform, around renters' rights. Uh, and I think the Commonwealth is fa fairly and squarely back at the housing debate table when we've been absent for at least a decade. Doesn't announcing spending over $300 million on football stadia in Tasmania, more than half of what the government is planning to spend on housing each year, seem just a little tin-eared? I mean, particularly in a state with an extreme housing crisis. Well, I think the uh, announcement you refer to, Laura, I mean, when you look at the detail of it, it is around creating a precinct around a stadium. And you've seen around the world, there's plenty of examples where there's been some excellent outcomes built around, um, you know, prominent land, such as the one at Hobart, uh, that can deliver really good outcomes from an urban um, city planning point of view. When, and when, did the, when, when did the precinct for housing actually get added into this scheme, Minister? So I think uh, from my understanding, and I'm, I've not been as close to it as perhaps Catherine King and the Prime Minister have, but my understanding was there was an initial approach with the Tasmanian government. There's been further work done in the last few months, but the Commonwealth's um, investment is really about how we maximise the opportunities on that precinct, including social and affordable housing as part of it, wharf upgrades, a whole range of things that can really activate and deliver benefits to the community. But we understand it's not... You don't see it in, in isolation as a stadium. There are other social and community benefits that can be driven around a project like this, and we intend, and that's part, certainly part of the requirements of, of using the Commonwealth investment. A analysis from Deloitte suggests your budget on Tuesday will return a surplus for the first time in 15 years. Can you confirm that? Well, I think Jim and I have been saying for some time... Uh, in a range of interviews um, in the last few months that uh, the near term will see a significant improvement in um, upgrades to the budget. That's welcome. It's needed. Um, it'll assist us with our fiscal strategy in terms of repairing the budget. But the, the 
you know, the out years, uh, the medium term, the pressures on the budget remain and the budget remains in a state of significant pressure. Um, you know, we've, those pressures that are coming towards the budget are increasing, not decreasing. Uh, and so the fiscal strategy, our repair work, um, you know, keeping a close eye on spending, making sure um, there's spending restraint is still a critical part of the work that's been before the ERC and will remain so in future budgets. I'm told that with the final forecasts showing huge a huge surge in tax collections that senior ministers have committed to around $20 billion extra spending in the last couple of days, does that suggest a big surplus would be a bad look for a Labor government that's being so parsimonious in its approach to welfare? Well, I don't think we look at things in terms of, um, you know, presentation, uh, and I don't know where that commentary is coming from, but uh, I would say that we have the, the fundamentals of how we approach this budget task, which started in October, we're continuing it in May, haven't changed. We've got an inflation challenge, so we've got to make sure that we're not adding, um, you know, adding in any... Um, you know, pressure on the inflation and that we're working hand in hand with the Reserve Bank. Um, and we've got to look at the growth story. What are we doing about investments to drive the productive side of the economy? So all of that was there at the beginning. Uh, it remains there. And I think on budget night, you'll see the culmination of a whole hundreds, if not thousands of decisions that try to get that balance right. Finally, the Prime Minister has said repeatedly that his ambition and that of the government is that no one will be left behind and that everyone will get an opportunity. What does that mean in practice if, wel if welfare payments leave millions of Australians living under the poverty line? Uh, the budget will have a very significant cost of living package and that cost of living package uh, will be targeted to those most in need. And I mean, people will have to wait till Tuesday. We're in that very awkward stage of the budget where decisions have been made but haven't been announced. But cost of living was front and centre in, in, in some of our thinking from the you know, from the get-go. But is, is, your and people... is your ambition, though, to actually, over the course of the, your time in government, to try to lift people out of poverty? Well, the Prime Minister's been clear in opposition and in government that every year we would look at the payments, look at what could be done, and in this budget you'll see um, the balance of those decisions of what is reasonable, affordable, um, and, and how we've made room for those investments in the budget. And, you know, I think people need to see it as a whole. It's not just on the payment side, it's also on the investments that will be made in programs to support people um, who are disadvantaged um, to live to their full potential. So I think people need to wait and see. Uh, the budget obviously isn't one decision in isolation about one payment. It's a lot of decisions across the board. And, you know, I hope that when people see it in, in its entirety, they'll see, I guess, some of the balancing out we've had to do, but that we have focused on those most in need. Katie Gallagher, thanks so much for your time tonight. Thanks for having me on, Laura.